Parametric surfaces. You may remember from lesson eight that we talked about vector valued functions as well as parametric equations. In that case, we looked at equations of a single parameter T. We're going to now generalize that to parametric equations and vector valued functions with two variables. These represent surfaces in three dimensional space instead of curves. So let's look at three equations of the form x equals x of uv, y equals y of uv, z equals z of uv. These are known as parametric equations. x, y, and z in this case are functions of the variables u and v, which are called parameters. Each pair, uv, corresponds to a point x, y, z equals x of uv, y of uv, z of uv on the surface. We could turn these three parametric equations into a single equation by using a vector valued function. Here we have the single vector equation, r of uv equals x of uvi plus y of uvj plus z of uvk. x of uv, y of uv, and z of uv are known as the component functions of the vector valued function r. Let's look at an example. z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared. The graph of this equation is a surface in three-dimensional space. You may recognize it as one of the six quadric surfaces that we've learned previously. This one is a paraboloid. Since it's negative x squared minus y squared, it's upside down, and the four tells us to shift it up four units. So here is a graphical representation of this paraboloid lying above the xy plane. There are infinitely many different ways to parametrize this paraboloid as there are for any surface, I'm going to go over two pretty simple parametrizations. For the first one, we can simply observe that in this case, z is a function of x and y. So we could just let x and y themselves be the parameters. Just to stress the fact that x and y are parameters, I'm going to rename them u and v. So we'll let x equal u, y equal v, then z equals four minus u squared minus v squared. The corresponding vector valued function is r of uv equals ui plus vj plus 4 minus u squared minus v squared k. Notice that the part of the paraboloid that I drew in this picture is the part such that u squared plus v squared is less than 4, right? Because if u and v are both 0, then we get that z is equal to 4, and we just get the point 0, 0, 4, which is the vertex of that paraboloid. If u squared plus v squared is equal to four, then we're in the xy plane. And since we used dashes to draw that circle, we're not including that as part of the paraboloid. Another nice way to parametrize this paraboloid is by using polar coordinates. Why don't you take a minute and try that yourself? Pause the video, try to parametrize this paraboloid using polar coordinates, and then resume the video to check your work with mine. So in this case, we're going to let x equal r cosine theta, y equal r sine theta, and then it follows that z is 4 minus r squared cosine squared theta minus r squared sine squared theta, which by the usual Pythagorean identity simplifies to 4 minus r squared. The corresponding vector valued function is r of r theta is r cosine theta i plus r sine theta j plus 4 minus r squared k. Notice that the part of the paraboloid shown here represents the part for which r is between 0 and 2, including 0 but not 2, and theta is between 0 and 2 pi. We'll include 0 but not 2 pi, although if we included 2 pi it would still be correct, but we get the same values as when theta is equal to 0, so it's not necessary to do so. Let's try another example, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. Notice that the graph of this equation is a sphere in three-dimensional space. A really nice way to parametrize this one is by using spherical coordinates. Go ahead and pause the video, try to write down the parametric equations as well as the corresponding vector-valued function, then resume the video to check your answer with mine. Okay, here's a picture of our sphere. Notice it's just the unit sphere. It's centered at the origin of radius 1 and we'll use spherical coordinates. Remember in spherical coordinates, x is rho sine phi cosine theta, but here rho is one because it's a sphere of radius one. So the distance from the origin to any point on the sphere is always one. Similarly, y is 
one sine phi sine theta, and z is one cosine phi. The corresponding vector valued function is r of phi theta equals sine phi cosine theta i plus sine phi sine theta j plus cosine phi k. The picture we drew is the whole sphere, so theta is running between 0 and 2 pi. This time I included the 2 pi, we didn't really need to, it could have been 0 less than or equal to theta less than 2 pi. We will have a little repetition here in this case, but phi is going between 0 and pi. This time we actually need pi, because phi equals 0 represents the positive z-axis, and phi equals pi represents the negative z-axis. You get different points when phi is 0 or phi is pi. Remember, just as another example, if phi is pi over 2, you get points in the xy plane. Another example, find parametric equations for the part of the right circular cylinder, y squared plus z squared equals 9, for which x is between 0 and 5 inclusive. Go ahead and pause the video and try to write down the appropriate parametric equations as well as the corresponding vector valued function, then resume the video to check your answer with mine. Here's a picture of that right circular cylinder, y squared plus z squared equals 9, and notice it's extending from x equals 0 to x equals 5. Since x is not involved in the equation at all, we're just going to let x be one of the parameters, say x equals u. And then I'm going to let y equal 3 sine v and z equals 3 cosine v. Okay, this is just one of infinitely many ways to parametrize this cylinder. The corresponding vector valued function is r of uv equals ui plus 3 sine vj plus 3 cosine vk, where u is going from 0 to 5 inclusive. Partial derivatives of vector valued functions. Just like we could differentiate vector valued functions with a single parameter, we could take partial derivatives of vector valued functions with two parameters. For example, the partial of r with respect to u is the partial of x with respect to ui plus the partial of y with respect to uj plus the partial of z with respect to uk. Just like in the one parameter case, we're just differentiating component by component. Similarly, the partial of r with respect to v is the partial of x with respect to vi plus the partial of y with respect to vj plus the partial of z with respect to vk. Let's try an example. Here's a vector valued function. Go ahead and pause the video, write down the partial derivatives, and then resume the video to check your answers with mine. So we have r of uv equals u squared i plus uvj plus 3 minus 2u squared minus 4v squared k. The partial of r with respect to u, well, we do it component by component. The derivative of u squared with respect to u is 2u. The derivative of uv with respect to u is v, and the derivative of 3 minus 2u squared minus 4v squared with respect to u is just negative 4u. The 3 and the negative 4v squared go away because they are constant with respect to u. The partial of r with respect to v. For the first component, the derivative of u squared with respect to v is just 0, so that goes away. The derivative of uv with respect to v is u. And the derivative of 3 minus 2u squared minus 4v squared is 0 plus 0 minus 8v. Tangent planes to parametric surfaces. A surface S is said to be smooth if S can be parametrized with a vector valued function r of uv whose partial derivatives are continuous and such that the cross product of the partial derivatives are never 0. Such a parametrization of S is called a smooth parametrization. Smoothness is necessary to guarantee that the partial of r with respect to u and the partial of r with respect to v determine a plane that is tangent to s at each point on s. For the rest of this lesson, we will be assuming that any vector valued function r of u v parametrizing a surface is a smooth parametrization. Okay, here we have a picture of a surface in three dimensional space. s is a parametric surface, we'll assume with graph r of u v. Let's take a point x0, y0, z0 on that surface, and we'll let u0, v0 be the parameter values such that r of u0, v0 is x0, i plus y0, j plus z0, k. If we fix v equal v0, then we get a curve that lies on the surface, shown in purple here. Then the partial of r with respect to u is a tangent vector to that curve at the point x0, y0, z0. Similarly, if we fix u equal u0, we get another curve on that surface passing through the point x0, y0, z0, and the partial of our respect to v 
is tangent to that curve at the point x0, y0, z0. If we let n be the partial of our respect to u cross the partial of our respect to v, this is going to be normal to the tangent plane at x0, y0, z0. And if we want a unit normal, we could easily normalize that vector because we're assuming smoothness by dividing that cross product by its length. This is known as a principal normal vector at u0, v0. Let's try an example of finding an equation of a tangent plane to a parametric surface. Go ahead and pause the video, try this example yourself, and then resume the video to check your answer with mine. Find an equation of the tangent plane to the parametric surface, x equals u, y equals v, z equals four minus u squared minus v squared, at the point where u equals three and v equals one. Well, the corresponding vector valued function is r of uv equals ui plus vj plus four minus u squared minus v squared k. When u is three and v is one, we get three i plus one j plus four minus nine minus one or negative six k. So r of three one is three i plus one j minus six k. The partial of our respect to u is i minus two u k. The partial of our respect to v is j minus 2vk. When we substitute u equal 3 and v equals 1 into the partial of our respect to u, we get i minus 6k. And when we make that substitution into the partial of our respect to v, we get j minus 2k. Then we take the cross product of those two partials at the point where u equals 3 and v equals 1. So notice that in this determinant, for the second row, I put 1, 0, negative 6. And for the third row, I put 0, 1, negative 2 for the components of those partials. And we get 6i plus 2j plus k as our cross product. So since the cross product is normal to the tangent plane, we could use that together with r of 3, 1 to write the equation of our plane. So it's 6 times x minus 3 plus two times y minus one plus one times z plus six is equal to zero. Another example, show that at each point on the sphere of radius A centered at zero, 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 the tangent plane to that point is perpendicular to the radius vector. As a hint, you may wanna parametrize the sphere using spherical coordinates. Go ahead and give this a try, pause the video, and then when you're done, resume the video to check your answer with mine. We're going to start by parametrizing the sphere in the usual way using spherical coordinates. And I'll write that as a vector valued function, r of phi theta equals a sine phi cosine theta i plus a sine phi sine theta j plus a cosine phi k, where phi goes between zero and pi and theta goes between zero and two pi. Let's take the cross product of the partials. For the second row, we took the partial of r with respect to phi, and we get a cosine phi cosine theta, a cosine phi sine theta, negative a sine phi. And for the third row, we took the partial of r with respect to theta. So that's negative a sine phi sine theta, a sine phi cosine theta. And since the third component doesn't have any thetas, its derivative is zero. Now, for the i component, we get zero minus minus, so plus a squared sine squared phi cosine theta. For the j component, we get negative a times negative a is positive a squared. So we have a squared sine squared phi sine theta. And going the other way, we just get zero. Now for the k component, we get a squared cosine phi sine phi cosine squared theta. And then minus minus, so plus a squared cosine phi sine phi sine squared theta. We could factor out the a squared cosine phi sine phi, and we're left with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta by the usual Pythagorean identity. That's just one. So we get a squared cosine phi sine phi. So that is our k component. This little trick about using the Pythagorean identity comes up all the time. With a little bit of practice, you should be able to do that in your head from now on. Now let's take the length of the cross product of the partials. We're going to square each of those components, add them up and take the square root. So we have a to the fourth sine to the fourth phi cosine squared theta plus a to the fourth sine fourth phi sine squared theta plus a to the fourth cosine squared phi sine squared phi all under the square root. Now using that same trick that we did to get the k component before, we see that we could factor out an a to the fourth sine to the fourth phi from the first two terms, and we're left with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which is just one. 
So those first two terms just add up to a to the fourth sine to the fourth phi. And notice I just copied the other term over plus a to the fourth cosine squared phi sine squared phi. Now, similarly, we could factor out a to the fourth sine squared phi from each term here. And we're left with sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi, which is just one. So we just get a to the fourth sine squared phi. And when you take the square root, that just becomes a squared sine phi. Okay, so the principal normal vector here, we get by just dividing the cross product of the partials by the length we just found, and we get sine phi cosine theta i plus sine phi sine theta j plus cosine phi k, which notice is almost the same as the original vector valued function r, except it's missing the a. So in other words, it's one over a times r. It's a positive constant multiple of the vector valued function r, and therefore, we have shown that at each point on the sphere, the tangent plane is perpendicular to the radius vector because 1 over AR is a normal vector to that tangent plane.